I found Nidaros a city of bricks and left it a city of marble. At least, a very large town befitting a manor lord. Welcome to the capital, the largest town I've ever made in the game with over 700 inhabitants, each with their own jobs, assignments, and duties. We have a full-on market district at the main square, a commoner's district filled with the goods from foreign lands, a tranquil outskirts region where farming brings food to the people, and of course, the noble district where expensive tastes rule, and where the grand church and manor sit close by. It doesn't come easy creating a town like this, and importantly, maintain it. But in this video, I'm going to show you how you too can accomplish this feat, even in the face of hardship. And with that, since only 10% of people watching this video are subscribed, it would mean so much to me if you decided to sub to the channel if you enjoy my style and what I make, and I thank you so much for doing so. You see, Nidaros isn't exactly a fertile place. In fact, most of the region is barren, a horrible place to lay down your shovel and strike the earth by any measure. But seeing as we have this absolutely wonderful hill right here, it's going to have to do. Manor Lords is a game that takes its time and allows you to contemplate your actions. But this doesn't make it easy. The first step towards creating a livable city is after all to keep your people fed, sheltered and happy, primarily in that order. To facilitate this, we must begin by laying down a logging camp, a well, a hunting camp, and importantly, building a granary and a storehouse. Since in the beginning of the game, your supplies are left on the ground and are at the mercy of the elements, meaning having storehouses to put them in is vital. Of course, homes come next, since your people need shelter, and you wouldn't be wrong to as quickly as possible try to build a church as well, since this raises your people's happiness significantly. You see, the thing about the people of Manor Lords is that they have needs, mainly related to housing, religion, and amenities, like having several types of food, clothing, and entertainment like ale-filled taverns available. But depending on where you're located in the world, filling these needs is going to be more or less difficult. Now since this region is barren, and a simple meat-gathering hunting camp wouldn't do, and in fact we don't have berries close to the town, I needed to make ample use of the house extensions, which you can pay for to feature upgrades like vegetable farming or egg-producing hens. While this does alleviate our food situation for a while, a lot more is needed down the road, especially since these extensions require gold we don't have a lot of, and that's something you're going to want to change. You see, in Manor Lord's early game, and frankly remaining so for a long time, the best way to get rich quick is to muster your men, those hard-working real America- I've, <laughs> I mean the hard-working common folk, and march on bandit camps that may or may not litter the lands outside your region. For the first few battles, you're gonna want to use your own levy for this, meaning that your economy will take a hit in the short term while your men is off campaigning. For you see, we're playing the long-term game here. And even though our workforce will be diminished for a time, once we take out one or two bandit camps, you get to reclaim their gold, giving you a huge boost and importantly, for that next bandit raid, utilize mercenaries to do the dirty work for you. If you time payments right or make sure you win, the mercenaries actually end up paying for themselves in a way, since the average mercenary unit costs half or even a third of the bounty you're about to behold, and allows your men to stay at home. One of the most important things you can do early game to fill the needs of your citizens is to use that hunting camp not just for meat, but for animal hides. Because now if you build a leather tanner, your people will now have one of their clothing needs met. When all of their initial needs are fulfilled, you can use that money you got from thrashing bandits to upgrade your homes to level 2. Which doesn't just make them look cooler, but opens up the inhabitants' ability to become artisans, essentially specialized workers who focus entirely on their profession, meaning they cannot be reassigned to other work anymore. This is important, because even though you need artisans to fulfill higher needs, like creating weapons, more intricate clothing, and the all-important ale, you need to make sure you have enough people left over who can be reassigned to work on whatever you need them to. With more and more things coming together, our town is not just able to defend itself, but is also growing. But remember this, and this is something you should know already at the beginning actually. In order to grow as quickly as possible, you should not only keep an above 50 or 60% approval rating in order to attract new people, but crucially, you need to build enough housing to accommodate them, housing with enough living space. It's also important to note that level 1 houses accommodate one family, level 2 houses accommodate two, and level 3 houses may house three families. So even though you'll be spending a ton of resources upgrading your buildings to create the ultimate city, at least you'll get more room and board as well. By this point though, you're going to want to start thinking about increasing your food supply, since to truly grow, food and fuel is absolutely essential. Now fuel is easy for the most part, just build a few woodcutters lodges for firewood near a forest. 
Remember how our fields lacked fertility? Well, there are a few things we can do now. First of all, as you progress through the game, you get technology points which you can use to enable new features, like rye farms instead of just wheat. Rye farms are better suited for tougher climates, meaning we can start to set up rye fields. Of course, fields need to be plowed and sowed and harvested, and your fields lose fertility after being used, so they cannot be relied upon more than every other year at a time. However, with our sturdy rye and enough people, we can set up farms a bit further away where the soil is better and hopefully build up a large enough reservoir to take us through the year. Of course, to produce actual bread, we need to grind the rye in windmills and bake the flour in bakeries. So there's a whole production chain involved here, which is important to be aware of. And more than just bread, to reach those level 3 houses, you're going to need ale, and a lot of it. Ale, however, requires barley, which requires fertile barley soil, and which afterwards must be turned into malt and then made into ale in a tavern. And because ale has such a demanding and lengthy production process, it is for the most part often going to be a medium to late game good. So don't worry about getting those level 3 houses until you're ready to expand your farming sector, or indeed trade for it. And speaking of trade, the second thing we can do is actually twofold. By now, you might have destroyed enough bandit camps to not just earn yourself a pretty gold pouch, but also a fair amount of influence. Influence is used to claim other regions, allowing you to set up new camps and build new villages. So, since like every single region surrounding ours is more fertile, that's what we do. And once we have established a farming heaven, we may build ourselves a pack station, allowing us to trade one town's resource for another. The other side of this coin though is pure trading, allowing you to use gold to open trade routes with off-map regions and either import or export resources. It must be said that this at the moment feels unbalanced and unfinished due to the pre-release nature of the game, because as it stands right now, I have to keep in mind that with little to no exception, importing goods demands a lot more gold than exporting goods net you. Now it is possible to make use of the better deals perk, which significantly cuts the cost of importing, but personally I feel like this tips the scales almost in the other direction, making it far too easy to use trade to dominate the game. In other words, to balance things out, we're going to have to export our most valuable goods like weapons and armor by the hundreds due to our strong industry in the hopes of balancing the cost of food. Over time and by combining all of the five food groups, the backyard farms, the hunting camps, the berry pickers, the actual farm fields, and the trading system with the hopefully optimal layout of marketplaces where people set up their stalls and distribute the stuff, you too can reach a mega town like this one. I think it's important to mention that personally, I don't make towns with efficiency and optimization as my main priority. I absolutely hate grid cities that constantly go straight left to right and up and down, and feel like they're not just an eyesore but a fun killer. And truly, Manor Lords is such a beautiful game that it would be a shame to not play around with various sizes and shapes of towns, and to get creative with roads and the positioning of windmills and whatever else. I took the L in this game in terms of fertile soil because I needed that hill for the love of the vibe, but what I sacrificed in optimal resource accumulation, I gained in beauty, in immersion, and not least of all in challenge. This region forced me to look elsewhere for food, making me create not just one other farming town, but two, the latter which sadly got burnt down by raiders, which I was too far away from to rescue in time. The fires could be seen as far away as from the top of my church tower. It was that bad, but also that cool. And honestly, it's awesome that one region's boons or malices do not inherently influence other regions, meaning it's not the end of the world if one region is sabotaged. And despite my perils, I managed to make the largest city I've ever built with over 700 inhabitants, and it's all the more beautiful and feels all the more rewarding for it. And I know you can do it too, even without turning to North American city planners. And with that, I'll leave you with a third person walk around the city from the Lord of the Manor himself. Let me know what you think of Manor Lord's take on city building so far, and if you enjoyed the video, remember to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.